So the topic uh, I chose is about the, uh, the competing years at the end of the course law. Uh, at the beginning that uh, I was giving another talk, I used the uh, word computing at the end of the Moore's Law. My Intel friends object violently, so you know, they never ending. But the Moore's Law has multiple legs. I think the one leg is already gone. That was uh, 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 due to the end of the DNR scaling. So basically, um, DNR scaling basically says you shrink the dimension and shrink the, the supply voltage simultaneously, so the power density remains the same. But you cannot do that around the uh, time of year 2000, basically 15 years ago. So now the power density is increasing. So that's why that uh, doesn't matter how much money you have, how much power run you get, you cannot buy a terahertz processors, right? So we can make terahertz transistors, we just don't have a way to integrate that. So I used to right, compete with my office mate, that you get a that, uh, 50, that, uh, that the megahertz, uh, the Intel processor, I get a 150, and the next day, that uh, or next month, you get 300. So it will stop at 2 to 4 gigahertz. That's what we have. And then the industry take a right hand turn with parallelization. So today, you can compare. I have four cores on my laptop. How many do you have? You can say I have eight, and then the other guy will have 16 cores. So that's where, it's, uh, the, the, where we stand. So the second leg, I think we are about to lose it. That uh, it's about the cost gating. So the fact that you can have uh, somewhere around five billion dollar, oh, five billion transistors in your pocket, you can still afford to pay for that. That's just a phenomenon. That's amazing. And uh, so the, the per cost trans, uh, per cost uh, per transistor cost has been decreasing. So um, that uh, there's various discussions saying that that's going to come to an end. And if you listen to some of the experts, they says that already ended at the twenty eight nanometer which I don't think so. I think we're continuing to decrease slightly. And at some point, it's going to end. Then it's going to be an interesting question. Maybe we can even make smaller transistors, but uh, are you going to pay exponentially increasing costs for your cell phone? Right? So think about it. That, uh, you have to have an economic reason for us to that, uh, drive the process. Uh, so, uh, so this is actually the trend. Given these considerations, uh, uh, almost exactly 10 years ago, 2008, when everybody is going to parallelization, right, to just respond to this end of the DNR scaling. So we're thinking, what's the big idea beyond that? So we come up with the conclusion, it should be the customization, where you can adapt the architecture to the application domain or to the workload to get this order of magnitude efficiency. So we are quite uh, fortunate. We got funded by Expeditions Computing Award. Some of you may be familiar with that. This is one of the largest uh, programs in NSF supporting the science, I mean, the computer science and information technology, uh, $10 million over five years. And uh, so we actually published a white paper on um, the, the design test in 2011. That's pretty much our proposal. It was uh, actually when this project funded in 2009. That's also led to the formation of a Center for Domain Specific Computing, which I serve as the director. So why we want to go that direction? So there's a motivated by several studies. This is an early study out of a UCLA professor, Ingrid Manahidi, when she was at UCLA, her group did this study. So the first line, you look at the point 18, I mean, this is looking at one application, um, the, the AES, the, the inclusion algorithm, right? So the, this shows you the, Totally customized solution, uh, so using uh, 0.18 micron CMOS. So that's 3.8 gigabits per second uh, at the two, uh, 350 milliwatts. So if you use a metric saying how many gigabits per second per watt can process, so you normalize it to one. The third, I mean, the third of ASM stands for assembly language on strong arm. At that time, that was a low power, the best low power processor. So at the 31 megabit per second, 240 milliwatts. So that's 85x away if you look at the gigabits per second per watt. And uh, the best the desktop at that time was Pentium 3. Again, you write most efficient assembly language. That turned out to be 800x away, right? So that's the gap between general purpose and uh, the, the customized solution is huge in the order of uh, 80 to 800. This is like uh, amazing that the data she published that you run Java on an embedded Spark processor, so the efficiency becomes a factor of three million away. So if you're not careful, this thing can be totally out of control. So you may say, hey, this is a somewhat old data back in 2003. Uh, there's a, a more recent study that uh, uh, maybe eight years
years ago by, uh, at Stanford, Mark Horowitz's group. So his group was looking at, uh, again, similar comparison, a more complex design, H.264, and also they started looking at uh, uh, parallel architectures, and, and this is CIMD uh, plus the VIW. So by doing that, you get a 10x that the energy efficiency gain. And then also the, use the customized instruction set to give you another 60% of energy efficient gain. But uh, if you look at the, uh, the totally customized solution, so this is a ASIC, right? And uh, versus the baseline CMP, CMD plus BRIW plus like customized instruction set. So this is still a gap of a 50x away, right? So that again, the general purpose and the, uh, and the versus a customized solution is huge. So if you're thinking about the Moore's law is going to come to an end at some point, so this gap gives you another, uh, at least uh, four or five generation, right? Which means another uh, 10, 15 years. Hopefully at that, by extending the runway by another 15, 20 years, something else coming to rescue either quantum computing or whatever that the nanotechnologies we're talking about. Uh, so uh, you may actually curious as well, wow, that actually looks horrible that the why we have been using processor all along that, uh, that the, with this uh, such a poor efficiency. So I actually we did the analysis to see where do we spend the time. So uh, this is actually uh, one of the typical auto auto processor can have. Um, so uh, we did the analysis. The problem is uh, with this instruction based architecture. So first, just to get the instruction you get the 9% of energy. The next thing is that you're going to decode it, whether this is an add or multiply, that's another 6% of energy. And then, um, you, in order to remove some of these uh, dependencies that uh, you want to rename it, that's 12%. And then you put it, uh, you get the data in the, from the registers. Uh, this is off a little bit, right? So, and then maybe the data is not quite ready, haven't been computed, so you have to stay in a reservation station to be activated later on, that's called the scheduling. And then finally, when you're ready to compute, you do either integer or floating point operation, you write it back to the memory. So this is useful, right? Because this is what you want to do. And then there's various kind of a control registers, finite state machines, so that's another 23%. So if you look at it, really the only useful that the computation is this part, the rest is all overhead, also the tax you pay with this instruction based architecture. So that uh, uh, if we remove that, that uh, it can be a lot more efficient. That's why when it comes to customized architecture, the data flows from input to output, goes to various processing stages. That's where the efficiency is coming from. Um, so you may ask that, uh, in, in fact, you can do further optimization. All the processors today come with 32 bits or 64 bits. You don't need that. And the memory operation is like an L1, L2, L3 cache. A lot of time you don't need that. I know exactly how much data I need and, uh, and then when it will be used and then you can put it back. So all of this give you another 10, 100x efficiency gain as well. Uh, so um, so you probably all heard about this. Uh, Google designed a TPU tensor processing engine. Uh, I, um, so that's actually um, specific for deep learning. I'll come back to talk about deep learning later on. So they claim this is 200x more efficient than the uh, latest uh, Intel CPUs, so 70x more efficient than um, G80 GPUs, although there have been uh, more recent GPUs later on. So that's actually, again, is the example to show you the gap between general purpose versus the, the specialized, the customized architectures. Uh, the question is, that, hey, this is, looks great. Why don't we build a customized chip every time we have? And uh, if uh, this is possible, first, if you have a lot of money, like Google, you can do that. The second thing is that uh, even your Google is facing the problem is that the, the algorithm keep changing, that the machine learning in particular is advancing so fast. Some of these architectures can be obsolete very quickly. Uh, but uh, coming back to, to think about it, uh, so what's the solution? Now our solution is that uh, we don't want to design an architecture which is totally fixed for one application domain. We want to actually design an architecture which is customizable, uh, but uh, with a lot of, uh, uh, with extensive use of accelerators. These accelerators don't have to be fixed, they can be programmable or composable. I'll talk about this uh, composability later on. And you want most of the computations to be done on the uh, accelerator, not on the processor. So I will argue that, that this is actually a fairly significant departure from the non-monotonous architecture. A lot of people talking about the non-monotonous architecture. This is a big step forward. And 
even when other architecture, you saw that, right? You have the data pass with control, and uh, it's very general purpose, all the instructions going through there. So you may ask, uh, why do we use this architecture? In fact, this architecture, we've been using it for 50, 60 years, is a brilliant architecture, in my opinion. You have to think about the reason it's being introduced. It was introduced during the days when the computing resources are scarce. And, uh, uh, so for some of the students I hear, do you know how many vacuum tubes are there in the first electronic computer? How many? And, uh, uh, in, I mean, you can argue which one is the first electronic computer. But then let's talk about ENIAC, right? So ENIAC has only about 18,000 uh, 18, vacuum tubes, if I remember correctly. And uh, fast forward for another 20 years, and how many transistors were there in the first Intel microprocessor? That's uh, uh, 4,004, right? That's only 2,200 uh, transistors. So when you have so few computing resources, the only sensible way, in my opinion, is to multiply, to do time multiplexing. So you have various kind of instructions going through the same processor pipeline that uh, to be supported efficiently. Uh, so that's actually this one size fits all um, that uh, result in the inefficiency. So today, how many transistors do we have? I think I just told you, right? Even in your pocket, you have about uh, 5 billion transistors. So it's a totally different game. That uh, uh, Now you have enough transistors, but you don't have enough power to power them. So that's the challenge we have. Um, so uh, that's the something that we want to change. Um, in fact, uh, so um, we are in this uh, era that uh, some people use the word dark silicon, so I have to think creatively to make use of this dark silicon, that uh, phenomenon, uh, to improve the efficiency a lot. This is actually a very important part, so uh, if you forget everything about uh, uh, this lecture, I want you to know about this following story. Because it's such a nice weather, I walked yesterday uh, uh, in the evening along the Charles River. As I walk, I saw two men, I was very busy. One person dig a hole about the one meter wide, one meter deep. And uh, just after a minute, the second guy comes in to fill it up. And uh, then, uh, then the first guy moved further, another three meters. If dig another hole, that uh, one meter wide, one meter deep. And uh, then a minute later, the second guy come in to fill it up. They repeat this three times, four times, five times. Kind of resist, I walk to them and says, hey, gentlemen, you are working very hard. I don't think you're accomplishing it. He looks at me and says, you must be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> he says, we're supposed to have a third guy. He's going to plant a tree, but he's sick today. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the message? The message is that when you have three guys, you should never specialize. You want to make sure that everyone can do everything, right? So that, that Marianne said, uh, we had a, a few spin-offs from UCLA, the startups. Uh, in the early days startups, you can call me whatever, chairman of the board, and the chief scientific advisor. You pretty much have to do everything, right? Uh, but then, um, as you scale, then uh, that, that's where specialization comes in. So today, the department will never hire the, the, the thousand high school students. You will want to hire three experts in machine learning, three experts in uh, precision medicine. So that's actually the, the specialization we're talking about. Um, so you can think about uh, this. Uh, I also talked about it, a lot of neuroscientists inside of our brain, which is uh, incredibly efficient, right, in terms of uh, the energy. Uh, we don't have a general purpose pipeline executing instructions. So what we have is uh, the specialized regions for motor control, for speech recognition, for body sensing. So I call these uh, uh, customized uh, accelerators, right? And the society is also organized in such a way you have lawyers, you have doctors, right? you have engineers. And so this specialization gives us a tremendous uh, the, the efficiency. So we're thinking about how do we do that efficiently. So uh, I think uh, since our proposal, uh, the project started in 2008, 2009, I think uh, the industry now is also coming to do this, uh, the, the similar practice. Um, um, Microsoft published a paper in ISCA 2014 uh, that disclosed, in fact, they had an internal effort um, to build a data center with FPGAs, which are, I'll talk about FPGAs in a moment, to do customization for uh, the search and the workload. The similar effort was at the Baidu, which is a Google equivalent in China. Um, the year up, 
after after that release, uh, then Intel um, acquired Altera, which is the second largest FPJ company. So they're coming up with a, a device where a CPU sits right next to FPJ, which you can customize for various kind of accelerators. Right? Uh, so that just the last year, in fact, I teach a class and start using that. And um, uh, Amazon allowed GPUs in the data center cloud and also FPJ there. So the industry is going into that direction to make sure that the heterogeneity customizability is introduced to improve the efficiency. <coughs> so um, over the time through that the, the project, the, the, um, it's actually a five-year project, and then after, at the end of that, um, so uh, I have to create this program called the uh, Intrans Innovation Transition and SF that program. They allow industry participation and uh, SF give the matching. So Intel was very much a believer of this one uh, that, uh, 2014. They come in to fund us for another three years with an asset matching. So um, through this, uh, uh, and now it's actually mostly industry funding with uh, some asset and also funding as well. So we actually learned the following things. The customization can happen multiple levels. One is at a single chip level. Um, I will talk a little bit. The second one is a server node level. The third one is at the data center level. Uh, so let me just briefly review some of our work on the um, single chip level. I don't have enough time to cover this topic. I want to give some more time to talk about the, the server node level, data center level effort we have. Um, so in this diagram, so it's going to be a very busy diagram. Let me see which is the laser pointer. Oops, that's the wrong one. So there we can use off-the-shelf components. The most convenient component 
This is just a very high level diagram to show you the overall kind of organization. Within the FPGAs, the, what they have is the very flexible programmable logic. So how do you get the, uh, the flexibility? Because it sounds very fancy. It says, okay, I have elements, can implement any K input functions. And that sounds almost magic, but it turned out it's very simple. That they just store a truth table there, right? A K input function need a, can have only a two to the K values. You just store a value there. So that's actually what have. And then you have to decompose your complex functions into all these small functions. Um, uh, we did a lot of work there on technology mapping. And then they also have distributed memories, and then also the multiplier. That, uh, um, so one thing, for example, you notice is that the first, I can allow you to create a customized that, uh, logic, and moreover, it can allow you to create a customized memory architecture through these small memory blocks, which I'll come back to talk about that. Um, and then you have multiple ways to integrate it. The easiest way is that you buy a card, you can put it on your PCIe bus. Right away, you get a CPU plus a PPU. <coughs> configuration that FPGA can be used for various kind of accelerators. Um, in fact, uh, there's a, a tighter integration. We got this unit uh, from Conway a few years ago. Now Conway is part of the, uh, I think, Micron now. They had four FPGAs connected to the front side bus and can talk to the processor right away. Um, IBM has a system called CAPI and uh, it allow you to talk to the uh, PCIe in a memory coherent fashion. And I talk about the, the Intel acquisition. In fact, before Intel acquired Altera, they kind of discrete unit CPUs plus FPGA through QPI bus on the motherboard that give us a, one test unit to play with. And the most recent one, again, we have it at UCLA, is that the, they have the CPU on FPGA on the same silicon substrate. Not the single chip solution, but through a kind of multi-chip module integration. So all of these are possible. Uh, let me give you one application we have is actually along the line of precision medicine. Um, the, the, the most important part is the precision medicine is to find your DNA sequences. It turned out to be a very compute intensive work uh, because when they sequence, they cannot sequence very long uh, segments of your DNA. They can sequence relatively short, like a 100 base pair to 300 base pair, right, uh, in the current technology, most popular technology. But how many base pairs you have? How many? You have three billion. So <laughs> I give you a lot of these small pieces that uh, you, it's your job to line them together to form on one. So this is uh, almost solving a, just a gigantic computational puzzle if you solve some of these jigsaw puzzles uh, with your children. So this is a, a mega version of that. So uh, what we actually uh, focus on is uh, accelerate this uh, alignment part. So you have billions of these short reads come in and uh, we can actually have a, um, uh, a specialized architecture. It turned out that, that uh, the most important uh, part is the dynamic program, right? As you imagine, to find out the best alignment. If you uh, accelerate that dynamic uh, programming per se, you can get some speed up, but it's limited because there's only uh, 100 to 300 base long, pair long, right? So you have so much parallelism within that. Moreover, the challenge is that uh, they typically have a seed stage. They will anchor it to some location and do the extension. You do not know how long this dynamic programming should be. It could be another five base pairs, could be 50, could be 150. So what we decided to do is something different. We have these PEs. Each one is specialized to do the sequencing, but we just have so many of them that are customized to do this sequencing alignment. So that's actually, that works out quite well. The speed up over the single thread CPU is all the way to 340x that uh, improvement. Even you compare to the uh, 24 core, we are still 13x better, right? So that's actually one example that shows you that the, the kind of the improvement you can get um, through this accelerator. Later on, I'm going to come back to talk about how do you integrate something like this uh, accelerator with the, the rest of the processing pipeline. It turns out that's not trivial. It's actually quite challenging. Uh, the, uh, another work we did is actually on this Intel uh, CPU plus FPGA platform is on compression. Uh, we use GZ just uh, without much thinking, but in fact there's a fair amount of computations involved. So we have, uh, I think, uh, the fastest, uh, uh, the higher throughput implementation. CPU was about 300 some uh, megabyte per second, we can do about 12.8 gigabyte per second. At this point, we're saturated by the memory bandwidth. We can actually accelerate further. So this is a 30, 40x speed up. So there's a lot of potential you can gain there. So that's actually the work you can get out of a, um, the uh, 
server no level. So once you have this, you should think about use that to accelerate some of the big data applications. Um, where is the uh, uh, so we're, that's why we're interested in looking at the data center level. Uh, I'm showing you some of these small systems we build, uh, and then I'm going to come back to talk about how you program this monster, right? Because that's the challenge that the most people uh, people here in this room probably will be interested to hear, uh, because you can have access to these devices, but how do I take advantage of that? So this is the early system we have. This is ZC is a zinc board. What is zinc architecture is that uh, you have uh, two ARM processors and uh, with a whole bunch of accelerators so within that board. So we have eight of them connected to an Ethernet switch. This is like a mini supercomputer. But each zinc is only two watts. With the board, it's about five watts. So this whole thing is very quiet without a fan. And then, so we can, that's actually one configuration we have. The other one is a more of a server-like of a platform. We have uh, 22 uh, Xeon-like servers, and there was one file server at the bottom, and the one master at the top. Um, so this is all standard server, except that uh, each server we actually have uh, one of these uh, Vertex 7 and PTAs with 16 gigabyte of memory on, onto that. So that's the configuration we have. Uh, but the challenging part is actually the software. You want something like this to be compatible with your standard Hadoop system, and then you use Hadoop distributed file system, and then to be able to run, for example, Hadoop and Spark program on that. So uh, I don't have the time to go into details, but at least I'll give you a flavor later on about how we did that. So once you have this, that uh, you can actually make some comparisons. Um, so the big core is the standard Intel server that can be used as a baseline. So we also try, for example, a lot of people are saying maybe in data center application have a lot of processors, the workload can be fragmented, and you don't need very big cores. You can use with ARM or like a, like a processors. We try that. It's actually a bad idea because uh, at least for the type of uh, workload we have, is on machine learning. I think we try two. One is the logistic regression. The other one is k-mean. So basically, one is a supervised learning. The other one is unsupervised learning. So the small core, the perform uh, the, the power is well, about two, one tenth of a uh, regular core, but the runtime can be much longer. As a result, the performance is uh, only twenty five percent of the, the standard server, and the energy efficiency is only twenty four percent. However, if you augment the small core with IPTAs, remember I talked about the Zinc processor; they have the ARM cores plus a lot of IPTA. So the IPTA can help you to do an acceleration. So that makes a lot of sense with that, uh, that PTA acceleration. Now you have 20% better in performance and 90% better that, uh, in terms of the energy efficiency. And what is more interesting is that uh, you have the big core, the server, plus that the card. So basically, you have to finish, right? So that, uh, and then you can hog, and you can do something that, uh, uh, that uh, frequency or voltage scaling. So you can get about 2.5x better performance and a 2.6x better energy efficiency. So this is actually quite significant. Think about it uh, uh, in a data center setting. So if you can get a 2.5x performance and improvement, it basically means that uh, you can replace two to three servers with one server plus the FPGA power plant. So FPGA only takes about 20 to 25 watts on the uh, PCIe slot. Uh, the server itself could be 300 watts. So this with a little bit of increase that, uh, in the power uh, budget, that, uh, and it can be a lot more efficient in that, the volume and also in energy usage. So that's the, some of the studies we have done. So um, in fact, this is a, a quite impressive, a very impressive uh, implementation out of Microsoft. They have the word called the, uh, the Microsoft Brain. So what they have is that they build their entire data center now, all have FPGAs. The FPGA is not with the, uh, the PCIe slot. The FPGA is actually on their networking interface. When outside the networking interface, you go through the FPGA, then you go to the, uh, the, the first level switch. So what happened is that you can reach tens of thousands of these FPGAs in a matter of uh, the milliseconds. So uh, basically, you get a network, or you get a sea of FPGAs. So, so that's they call it the reconfigured computing layer. So, for example, if you look at their latest result, they can map very large uh, uh, neural networks to that and uh, get a uh, very impressive result. Um, so, um, look at the time a little bit. Where I want to 
spend uh, uh, more time to talk about, however, is the, the compilation process. Because uh, these systems we can build, and obviously you can see in this, we can build a bigger, better version of those systems. But the, the key challenge, however, is that how do you program? How many of you have programmed at ETA? Yeah. Right. So um, I guess if I ask you in private, you probably say that's not a very pleasant experience. I would rather go write my that the C program or MATLAB program, uh, which is not surprising. But uh, uh, that's actually have been a big focus in my lab in the last uh, uh, two decades. So first, we created this tool that uh, uh, Marion that I mentioned. It's a high-level synthesis tool. It started with a university research project. Uh, so I want to basically raise a level of abstraction. You don't have to use a VHD or very long. You even don't have to learn about it. Um, you can use your uh, traditional, uh, a lot of traditional software program to design chips. So we can start with C, C++. System C is just a C++ extension for hardware design, right? And then we can go through as a compilation, optimization, and then we do hardware synthesis, and we generate this VHD off that the Verilog automatically, so then we can design FPGA and ASIC. So uh, we we'll started the research project. By the way, I don't take the credit for having the first idea. This concept of silicon compilation has been around for a while, back in the late 1980s. And the various research group in the industry tried it. But uh, really, it didn't get a large scale deployment for multiple reasons we can talk about uh, uh, in more details later on. Um, so when we started the project, that was in 2003, 2004, that time frame. So we really put in a, a very serious effort on the optimization side, on the platform modeling, and also we're fortunate we're leveraging this LLVM compilation framework. Some of you may know if you use an Apple laptop like uh, what I do, all the compilers that the there was doing LLVM. So today is a no-brainer being used in a lot of the compiler classes, but you have to give us credit. I think we started using it at the version 1.1 or version 1.2. <laughs> So it's back in the early 2000s. And then we take a very different usage. Instead of compiling to ARM processors, Intel processor, AMD processor, we'll compile it for a totally customized hardware. So, um, so that actually turned out to be a very good uh, effort. Um, if you go back the transition, so we had a project uh, uh, around 2006. A lot of people want to use it. So we form a spin-off company called Auto ESL. Uh, so all uh, ESO was providing tool for both FPGA and ASIC, but eventually Zilinx acquired the company in 2011. So of course Zilinx was an FPGA company, so they wanted to be all for FPGA. Um, so it's a bit widely used. I do not know what is being used in the classroom here uh, at the uh, NEU. I certainly use it in my classrooms. So if you just look, uh, re they renamed the tool, Zilinx renamed the tool to be Vivado HLS. They call all their tool suites are with Vivado. HI stands for high level synthesis, right? You just do a Google Scholar search, there's uh, over 2,000 publications already using it. Of course, there are more industry users, they don't talk about too much of that. Um, so, since then, uh, we have been focusing on, um, but if you have used the high level synthesis, you will find out indeed you can write C programs, get a BHD or Verilog comparable to human data. But however, the catch is that not every C program will give you that performance. <coughs> so you have to be somewhat uh, uh, an expert on using the tool other than to come up with a highly uh, carefully designed or optimized C program. So we want to lower that barrier. So the research we have been doing uh, after that is uh, after the acquisition, uh, first uh, after the acquisition, I don't have control of the high level census part, but we are working one layer beyond that. Basically, we want to do source to source transformation. So you can write a fairly generic C program, we can come up with the optimized C program for you. Where the optimization can be, for example, you can do the loop structuring optimization, and, uh, and then you can do data layout optimization, right? array partitioning, data reuse. You can do the intermodule optimization. The, the uh, HLS is very good for you to synthesize an FFT module, DCT module. How do you connect them together, right? And uh, it's uh, what happens if I want to use some special architectures like a systolic array or stencil computation, 
So this microarchitecture optimization, and then, and then more recently, we want to support things at an even higher level, the domain-specific language, DSLs. Uh, for those of you who are doing machine learning, you know you use uh, CAFE or TensorFlow, and uh, for image processing, we may use Highline, and the big data, we use Spark. So these are the directions we have, and so we have a sequence of papers. Obviously, we don't have time to go through all those papers, so let me just pick one or two designs. So one application I give it to you is, uh, I mean, the uh, example I give it to you is the compilation or stencil computation. So this is a very popular in image processing, uh, where um, you have a uh, one pixel, which actually need to be updated by the four nearby pixels or nine nearby pixels, depends <coughs> what's two D or four D, right? So if you want to do it, um, in you write it in this fashion that you have an A array and you update it into the B array. And if you just translate it into FPGA, it's typically at no speed up. In fact, most likely you get slow down. The reason is that the FPGA, you have the array mapped to a memory block. Uh, on FPGA, every memory block has only two ports. So it only can read out two numbers at a time, where actually you want to use four numbers simultaneously. So this is a very common problem. Many cases that you have to deal with this. So how do you do? You, what do you do that, uh, in this case, you have so many limited memory ports? One way is that you just duplicate your data, right? And then so you can store it in memory. But that's not a very uh, clever solution. It's so very wasteful. A better way is that uh, maybe you can scatter your data into different arrays. For example, all the even data, uh, the even indexed data go to one array. All the off indexed data go to another array, right? So that's how you can get some performance. But this, in general, is that you can ask the question, hey, how do I partition it, right? So this is a, a, the example I'm talking about. For example, if you want to do this stencil computation, you want to update this cell here. You have you also the value of this four cell. And you want to do all of this in one clock cycle to make sure all these five cells are in different memory banks so you can access them simultaneously. Not only in this one cell, you want to make sure as it moves, that uh, it, everywhere you don't get confident. Moreover, you can say, I actually have enough processing engine, I want to do three of them updating simultaneously. Now you want all of this to be in different memory banks, right? So that's actually the challenge you have to face. Uh, my student was doing that manually. So you, when you write C programs, you create many memory arrays. Now the not one of memory array, you can have A11, A12, A21, A22, for example, you have four arrays. You have to figure out which data goes to where. Obviously, that's very painful. That uh, you can write C program to do that, but we want to automate. So this actually we have very uh, nice result. In fact, uh, uh, so this is the animation just to show you as you move on, you want to make sure this uh, uh, non-conflict condition always satisfied. Uh, so for stencil, it turned out that we have a very clever way to do that. By the way, first in general, we have a way to do that. But stencil it turned out that there's a very efficient way to do that, is that we published 2014. For this, you can actually come up with uh, three, uh, come up with four FIFOs for this uh, five-point uh, stencil. And then as you move along the data, so you want to make sure that uh, these data can all be reused, right? Uh, you, once you're computing this one, all these data can be reused. Uh, so you want to put it there, and then uh, as you move along, that uh, you will actually add one more piece of the data, everything shifted by one. And then when you move another uh, point, that uh, everything shifted by one. So you can actually verify this architecture, guarantee you to have the minimum amount of uh, data movement from off-chip to on-chip every time you do one. And also it has a minimum movement, that uh, uh, minimum amount of on-chip buffer. So this, all you have is to exactly store all these data in this way. Um, so you can prove this optimality, uh, optimal size of re uh, interval reuse buffer, maximize data reuse, optimal number of memory banks. So this is, a, by the way, shows you the power of customized computing, right? So you can, for this problem, you can customize the architecture the way you want, so you can have minimize the data movement. Um, so uh, my student, actually, I have a student, uh, this is a work under submission, he is saying, hey, that's actually a very clever design. What happens if you want to process multiple stencil points simultaneously? 
right? So you can actually you have the loop, you can unroll that. If you unroll that, this is actually the challenge. Now, um, you have uh, all of these points want to be updated that uh, uh, simultaneously, and moreover, you want to avoid the conflict. So you can have a, a very elaborate parallel reuse chain. Uh, I will not go into detail, but the idea is that now you can have a more complex structure. So every, let's say you process three points at a time, right? So every time I'll process three points, and then so the data will be arranged this way. And after the processing, I'll move on, and I get three more points comes in, and then I'll move on, uh, the, the data gets shifted. So this can move in a very nice fashion every time I consume three, day, three new data. And then I guarantee all these uh, um, data can be accessed simultaneously without conflicts. You can see all the tabs coming out allow you to this, do these updates uh, three pixel at a time. I mean, updating three pixels at a time. And then I can still have the property that the minimum data movement and the, the maximum reuse and also the optimal memory banks. So, um, so this is actually one example we have. Uh, so the, the difference is actually quite significant that uh, you can see uh, if you do the uniform partition, you need uh, uh, seven library banks. And uh, you can achieve i equal to one means that when you do pipelining, this is the initial interval. One is the best you can get, right? You, you, but you only support one processing engine. So in our case is that uh, we can support that uh, uh, six memory banks plus some of three blocks. We can also achieve optimal. And then that, uh, with, um, uh, we can have multiple. In this case, it's a three processing end. So your speed will be three x faster. Uh, but with uh, very minimum uh, overhead. Um, so a lot of these things that you can say, that's actually a very clever design. What happened if I want to use it? Um, so this is actually the overall scheme we have that uh, kind of uh, incorporated many of these results. Uh, so we are going to start from a C program, and with a little bit of user directive, you says this section I want to accelerate, and, uh, and in fact these loops can be uh, pipeline or parallelized, you can give hints, right? So we can automatically do the hardware software partitioning and do the optimization at the end that we generate OpenCL. I don't know how many of you have tried OpenCL before. Uh, I teach a class at UCLA called CS133. Uh, within this class, that uh, we have uh, OpenMP, MPI, and OpenCL. Students really don't like OpenCL. It's <laughs> convoluted, and also, um, once you make a partition, you cannot go back very easily, then you have to rewrite it. So that's actually the idea. We take like an open MP kind of uh, sy uh, the, the sy syntax. It's very easy. You can just say, hey, I want to parallelize so this loop. And then we can generate all of those automatically. Not only that, so things like a memory partitioning and um, some of the special architecture uh, support, we can all incorporate in this. So basically, we're going to massage your C code into a C code very friendly to this kind of optimization. Uh, uh, once we have this tool, in fact, there's also people who want to use it because this is really what you want to use at the server node level or the data center level because the handle the CPU plus IPDA call optimization. So this is actually, um, so there's a, uh, the latest spin-off uh, from um, the lab is that the, they created this tool called the Merlin Compiler and the company called the Falcon <coughs> Solution. This is funded by Intel Capital. So they give you this source-to-source -source compiler. You can take C, C++ with Pragma. At the back end, it can give you this uh, optimized OpenCL code either for actual change Intel, uh, Altera to Intel, because it's not part of the Intel now. Uh, either Intel or Zion's PTA. So, and also they does all this optimization for you. For example, if you don't do any optimization, you manually partition, and you are 21x worse than the possible that they are manually designed. That, uh, I'm sorry, you know, I mean, that Merlin compiler can be 20 some x better and it's getting very close to the manual design. Because you get a horrible OpenCL code, of course you aren't going to use it right away, right? You're going to refine it, refine it, refine it manually. But it's just a very long and a tedious process. Now, most of my students actually went through this multiple times. 
Uh, to them, it's good that uh, after you refine it, uh, that uh, three or four times, you'll, you'll get a 15, 20 X improvement that can be a paper. But it shouldn't be like this every accelerated design result of research paper. So we want this to be more of a push button solution. So with this, actually, I'm going to end with the one last example is on deep learning. I guess it's hard to give a talk these days not to mention deep learning. Um, so uh, I think this concept is probably uh, known to many people already, right? It's actually very simple. It's uh, uh, you do multiple level of convolution, um, and then between the convolution layer, you also do some nonlinear operations, RELU, uh, the max pooling. Uh, the convolution really it says that I have a convolution kernel. Uh, I have a convolution kernel to be convoluted with either, uh, every one of these feature maps and I'll compute the new feature map. So that's actually the, the computation I illustrated. You have different convolution kernels with different feature maps and you can use to compute the new feature map. Right? Um, so if you look at it, uh, this problem actually, uh, to my surprise, it uh, has a huge, huge interest and in uh, really is exploding. We were fortunate that uh, we did, uh, uh, to some extent, maybe the first uh, uh, acceleration work on FPGAs for deep learning. There's actually multiple publications on accelerating convolution neural network in general, but uh, we just uh, published it. The reason is that I had a dinner with uh, Yang Makun, he's one of the pioneers on um, this uh, uh, convolution neural network back in Beijing, that uh, when we were visiting, both of us invited to give talks to the uh, Baidu. So after that, he told me the success there. I was still suspicious as of the neural networks, this thing trying, it was not successful, right? He said, no, 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 this time is different. You should look at this image net result. So we looked at this, so I was very impressed. So we designed an accelerator in 2004, 2014, and it was published in 2015. Look like citation. I don't have any papers goes with this rate. It's actually within a couple of years, it's actually over 300 uh, citations. Um, so really, the, the convolution, the engine, the kernel is very simple. It's a six-level nested loop because what you want to do is that for every point in the output feature map, you're going to go through all the input feature maps and. Uh, and then, of course, they also go through this convolution layer. It's actually two-dimensional. So that's a basic six-level nested loop. Uh, life will be easier if everything fits on chip. Basically, if all the weights and all the feature maps fits on chip. But most likely, it's not the case. So, so you have to have a continental divide. You says, okay, some of these loop bounds are too large. I'm going to cut it off. So you can do some loop tidying. And then that depends on which set of a loop you tile, then you get a very different behavior. Basically, for this tile loop, that loop can be executed on chip. And then those outer la layers will be actually off chip. The data will be transmitted from off chip to on chip. So, this is a big challenge that the data movement can be a significant uh, uh, the factor. Now, let's say even you look at the, this, the loops on chip, I can ask you should you pipeline it? Or should you parallelize it, right? Uh, which loop should you pipeline? Which loop should you parallelize? And also, now you talk about the tiling, then can ask the question, which loop do you want to tie? Do you want to tie all the loops, some of the loops? And then what's the tiling factor? Do you use four, uh, x smaller, eight x smaller? So it's actually a non-trivial design space. So this is actually, uh, I give you this example about the domain specific optimization, right? So this is exactly the space we're at. Uh, so in fact, uh, just talking about the abstraction gap, if you talk to the domain experts, people who work on deep learning, they even don't write C program. A lot of times they write something like this, this is a cafe. They just, it's more kind of a descriptive. I say, so I'm going to have a nine layer network, uh, nine layer network, right? And the first layer, how many neurons, and how it's going to connect it to the next layer. And from there, we construct it, we can convert it into high-level synthesis code. This is 600 some lines. And we generally the very lock, this is a 10,000 lines. So this is a kind of a semantic gap we have, we want to bridge. So um, now our solution is that, uh, so we want to raise the level, for, uh, abstraction level further. So we can start with a cafe like a DSL. And uh, I, I talk about this merging compiler, we make use of that. 
And uh, so, well, then we can do a design space exploration. So we can say, hey, what loop should be parallelized? What data should be reused? And then the spatial temporal, uh, the PE mapping, and the data dependency on chip organ, uh, off chip, and on chip memory reduction, the DDR transfer optimization. And in particular, we want to use this uh, uh, systology architecture because this is like a matrix uh, to matrix multiplication. Uh, it's very suitable for this systology architecture. So by definition, the, the systolic rate allows only nearest neighbor communication. So it's highly scalable. So you only send data to your right or uh, right, uh, left neighbors or up and down neighbors. So now the question is also challenging. So you have this six level nested loop. Which one should you be the, to use for systolic communication? In fact, not all the loops can be suitable for that. So we actually have to do that, uh, the selection. And so this work published in the Data Automation Conference last year. So um, you, you can take a look. It's uh, one of the best paper award candidate. So at the end, that uh, if you do an exhaustive search, even with the, the computer, you're talking about 300 some hours, and then we can reduce to 20 seconds with a number of pruning process. Um, so on this trip, we can actually achieve about uh, uh, several terror uh, operations per second. I will say this is a case that uh, the GPU is doing a fantastic job, that uh, the PGA still has a significant gap. So I want to, before I end, I want to highlight some of the, uh, the recent project. We have a new project funded by Intel and NSF. The, the, where we want to create it is a hydro uh, CL language, and um, it uh, allows us heterogeneous execution in a single uh, program. Uh, in a single programming language, multi-program abstraction. So then we can map different DSLs, like a Halide, a Spark, and uh, other domain specific language to that very efficiently. I know uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about too much about the runtime support. Runtime support is very important. Even when you have the accelerator, you have to decide, uh, for example, I have 24 cores, right? I want to use this one. Who got to use it? And then what data can be cached there? What data has so the, all of those is actually were managed by this runtime system. Uh, and then we also have the, uh, uh, well, we want to make sure that we have enough software support. If we use high level synthesis, we can assume it's correct by construction. So my accelerator is correct. But the challenge is that the, how do I know it's efficient, right? When I get a 2x speed up instead of a 200x speed up at home, where do I go to tune? So we have this uh, performance debugging capability that we're going to develop. In fact, we have part of that already, being to figure out what's the bottleneck on chip. Um, and then this is a joint effort with uh, 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 Brian Kim at UCLA, and also Drew and uh, Adrian from Cornell. Drew was my former PhD student. It was also uh, a uh, co-founder for RESO, who did a high-level synthesis. So I think I'm going to end here. A few messages I want to uh, that share with uh, everyone. One is that I think we're in an exciting era of uh, uh, computing at the end of the Moore's Law. Uh, we believe that uh, this accelerator-centric uh, computing platform is very important, that uh, we need a very efficient support for customization and uh, specialization. It can happen at the different levels, that the chip level, that uh, a sensor node level and the data center level. Uh, although, just through some of these early discussions, I was uh, uh, mentioning to Edward, we're thinking about another level, it's just the, at the edge computing level, because that's the people also talk about the fog level. That's a lot of interesting things are happening, right, with the IOTs and other things. Um, I think data center level is very important because that's where a lot of workload aggregates and uh, you can get a very efficient uh, leverage of this. Um, but uh, I think for all of this to be successful, in my opinion, the software is the key. You can build these uh, hardware systems and, uh, that, uh, that uh, as much as you want, but if you cannot program it, that uh, it's not going to be successful. Uh, in my view, that uh, the right way is to enable the existing programmers to run their application to that very efficiently. So that's, I'm talking about, uh, for example, Hadoop, MapReduce, Spark, OpenMQ. So all of those are, are important.
Um, so our goal, as I said, is uh, I really want to democratize this customized computing. So the circuit design or clearer design shouldn't be that hard. You have to take an E degree, that the master and PhD to do that. I really want the every entry level programmers to be able to do that. So now our kind of uh, tagline is that you innovate kind of with whatever algorithm, image processing, machine learning, and we just automate it. We the rest of the, to come to uh, FPGAs, customized ASICs should be as straightforward as uh, uh, pushing a button, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to end here. I want to acknowledge the contributions from all the center faculties. This is the original team for the NSF uh, expedition project. And of course, a lot of work is done by this army of uh, graduate students, postdocs, and the collaborators we have. I'd be happy to take uh, any questions.